Okay, my name's Neville Burns and uh, I'm a full-time herpetologist. I work with reptiles um, as a profession. I actually do training courses for keepers, I do training courses for ecologists, outdoor workers, councils, and um, a couple of times a year we meet with doctors and nurses in rural areas and I give them displays of snakes and talk about the effect of venoms. Uh, I also do shows in shopping centres and uh, fairs and carnivals right across New South Wales. And um, that's about it. But Neville, you've just produced a book. Could yeah. you show us the book, please? Because the cover looks fantastic. Yeah, no problem. I've uh, finally, finally got the book done. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And, and uh, I've been very pleased with the response to it so far. It's only just come out, so I'm starting to move them around. I sold quite a few on pre-sale. Yep. And uh, it's been getting a good response on Facebook from the one person who's read it so far. Well, I'm loving it. I'm three quarters of the way through. Excellent. And I believe because of the demand, there might be a, um, another, another one coming after this yes, one, possibly. Yes, there will be. I had to control my enthusiasm just to keep it down to a reasonable level for the first one. But there's a lot of other stories I can tell. So, Neville, when did you start your, your passion, your hobby? Um, I was always fascinated by any wildlife, Mike, and I got into reptiles when I was about seven years old. Okay. And I've uh, been handling snakes ever since. And you travelled to Queensland as quite a young guy, I gather, too. Yeah, I took off from for Queensland just before I turned 17. And um, I went up there and caught a lot of pythons. And then in those days, because there wasn't the conservation rules there are now, I actually got work in wildlife parks and was paid to collect animals for other zoos. So I was living the dream, being paid for a great passion. And I believe you had some, um, you work with Skippy too. <laughs> yeah, I worked as an um, animal handler for Fauna Productions for the Skippy movies. I worked on the actual um, feature movie and uh, quite a few of the, the TV series. So uh, that was interesting. It was a good job. And what makes you um, interested in actually highly venomous snakes? What's the fascination? I really don't know, mate. I've always been fascinated by venomous snakes. It's just something, I think there's a gene there that's out of place somewhere. <laughs> I was born with it. It's, it's what I am. It's not what I do. <laughs> what would your, your favourite What would your favorite snake first off in Australia would be? What would that be? Uh, probably the coastal taipan. Right. Yeah. They're more intelligent in my book than other snakes. They're more dangerous. I think if I was asked to say what is overall the most dangerous snake on earth, I'd say the coastal taipan. Is that because of its aggression rather than its venom? Or? Um, toxicity of venom, quantity of venom, size of fangs, length of the actual snake, they go to nine foot or more, um, very long forebody, so they're tremendously accurate strikers, and they're just pure muscle. Really dangerous. And uh, what about you, mate, Flossie? You and Flossie have a, uh, a certain passion for a certain species of snake too, don't you? Yes, yes, yeah, we, we like our death adders. <laughs> <laughs> what, okay, please tell us, what is it about death adders that you like? Uh, I think they're just different to everything else. I mean, they're not really an adder. Our first white ancestors here came from England where they've only got the adder as a little short, fat snake, nowhere near as deadly as what we call the death adder. But the death adder is actually an elaborate. It's a front fang venomous snake like the browns and tigers. But it's different in shape and habit. It's a master of conservation, fantastically uh, fast snake when it strikes, you know. They're just an interesting animal. Big fangs. I mean, before there was an anti-venom, 60% of people bitten by death adders died within two hours. Right. Uh, What's the main uh, snake that causes the most fatalities in, in Australia still? The worst now is our eastern brown snake. Right. The common eastern brown. Are they people who just happen to fall on it or stumble it, or are they trying to catch it or kill it? A large percentage of them are the result of someone trying to interfere with a snake. Right. Either trying to catch it or kill it, which is stupid. Right. That's part of your education campaign for all your life, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in America today, 80% of people bitten by rattlesnakes are young men trying to kill or catch them. Right. Same thing. Right. You know, it can be avoided just by being sensible and leaving the snake alone. And for America, uh, so for overseas viewers, too, you knew Steve Irwin too at one stage, young oh, Steve. Oh yeah, yeah, I knew Steve for many years. As you know, we were good mates, and I'm still in touch with his uh, his dad. I'm part of Bob's um, Conservation Foundation, which is invitation only. So I was flattered that he asked me to join. But I talk to Bob every few weeks on the phone and have a chat to him. I believe you're going, possibly going overseas too at some stage? Yeah, well I've been offered the chance to, um, people have offered me a bit of money towards a trip to go over later this year um, to Hindley Park, which is the biggest two-day expo for reptiles in America. They get something like 50,000 people in two days, 
and uh, I've been offered the chance to go there and sign books and talk about what I do and hopefully sell a few more copies of the book. I gather too in your early days you were doing a lot of crocodile wrestling and grabbing crocodiles. And... Yeah, I did a lot of work with crocodiles and at one stage um, my business partner and I ran a business called Terra Australis Productions and we were the only company in Australia moving big crocodiles for large promotions. So we became very well known for that. We'd move three or four metre crocodiles and put them in a pool at some promotion for a company, you know, and it went over really well. What was what would be probably the nastiest encounter you ever had with a crocodile yourself personally? Uh, I've had a few close shaves. I've never been badly bitten. Yep. I've had a, a slight bite from uh, a freshwater croc and one bite from a small alligator, but I haven't actually had any bad bites from uh, salties. But I think probably the closest was when uh, I've had a hip replacement recently, and that was overdue. And I slipped when I was moving away from a five metre crop. And if he'd have known that my hip locked at that stage, he'd have got me. But he stopped at the last moment. He lunged and then stopped. And if he'd lunged again, he would have had me. <laughs> That's a pretty scary. So I'm glad I got the hip fixed now. And you had a, you used to you were renowned at one stage for having you know, a very um, large python. Yeah, Barry was um, on a special license. She was a um, female um, Burmese python. And when I actually sold her, because I was hoping to go overseas on a project, I sold her to Crocodilus Park in Darwin. She made the front page of the Northern Territory paper as the biggest snake in the Territory, and she weighed 90 kilos. <laughs> what sort of food bill would it have been to... She was very cheap to feed, Mike. I used to give her about um, two chooks every month. That was about it. Chooks cost me two dollars each. Is it all? And uh, feathers and all, in they go. But I mean, she could eat an animal the size of a goat without any problem. How fast was she when she wanted to be? When she wanted to be, very quick. Didn't you tell me? Quick. Did you tell me some story about one time you let a mouse in and the mouse, it, she moved quicker than you actually saw the actual strike or something like? Oh yes. I mean, somebody came here one day, a friend of um, my partner's, and she said, "Can that big fat snake move quickly?" And I said, "Watch her." And as soon as she smelt the food. She, I knew what she'd do. She struck straight at the door and I had my foot against the door so it wouldn't fly open. And this woman, she was a large woman, she was down the other end of the room in one jump. And she said, my goodness, I never thought a snake like that could move that quick. So deceptive. Yeah, very. How big will she get to? Um, that's a good question. She was about just over five metres when I sold her. And she was 14 years old. They lived for at least 30 to 40 years. She may never stop growing. Oh, is that how it works? The growth it? rate is so slow that you don't notice it. Yeah. yeah. I thought she'd stopped at um, 15 foot four, and when I measured her a year later, she was just on 16 foot. So, still growing. How many times have you been bitten by venomous snakes? Uh, major venomous bites about 12. Right, and every time you ended up in hospital. I went to hospital for each one, but I only got treated for five mites because seven are what we call dry bites where the snake actually did not inject venom. Uh, for the ignorant like myself, does that mean it, 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 it didn't try to inject venom, or how yeah, does that exactly. work? exactly. It's up to the snake if they want to inject venom, and they can. I guess it's like the difference between a push and a punch. You know, you push your mate away because he's been a pain in the butt. You don't punch him in the head, but the snake says, go away, leave me alone, gives you a quick snap, but doesn't inject venom. Can all, that's that's can, why people recover from bites. Can all snakes differentiate like that? They Just can about all snakes can do it, yeah probably up to 70% of the time it is a dry bite, which explains why people come to me and say, I've been bitten by a tiger snake, it had no effect, and somebody else has died from it. Yep. It all depends on the quantity of venom. And your book goes through the early history of all the snake handlers, doesn't it? Yeah, well in those days it was, it wasn't an industry like it is now, Mike. I mean, there was a, a handful of really keen reptile people, and we used to get together socially, you know. Nothing was sold, we swapped things, we helped each other out with animals we needed for our work. Um, it was... A different atmosphere. Now it's become a, a gigantic industry and hobby following on America. Um, there's advantages to it. There's a lot more people appreciate snakes now, but uh, there's disadvantages too because people get into it just to breed snakes and make money. And we saw a few of them drop out when the prices of snakes started to come down due to the fact that they were being more commonly bred and the prices wouldn't hold. So the prices dropped some of these people got out. I don't think they're a loss to the industry at all. Who were the main influences on you as early snake handlers in, at, at that time? My biggest influence was Eric Worrell, and particularly through his book, Song of the Snake. So I'm very pleased that somebody has said that my book is the best insight into the old days of herpetology in Australia since Song of the Snake, because that was a book that inspired me to leave home.
So maybe I'll inspire a few more people. <laughs> with, was, there, was it La Perouse where the snake pits were? Yeah. Uh, who was that gentleman there? Because he helped you a lot Johnny too. Can. Right. George and Johnny Can. George was my best mate. George died a few years back. Uh, John retired about four years ago after 48 years in the La Perouse snake pit. The boys had taken over from their father, George Sr., in the early 1960s and uh, they ran it for all those years, Sunday afternoons, public holidays, uh, whenever the weather would allow it. And after John, John retired, there's been four of us that have got together to try and keep the shows going. And uh, between myself and three mates, we try to get down there each Sunday and you know, do a show for the people. What's your website? Uh, my website is Blue Mountains Reptile Awareness. Yep. Uh, if you Google that, you'll find me straight away. And that's got details of the courses I run, the shows, uh, all the things I do, it's got a little bit of video stuff on there from things I've done. And, and if people want to buy your book, they go to the same place? Absolutely, yeah. Just uh, email me or get, uh, get on the phone number that's there because the book's only available through me. And, yep. You know, I'll have outlets at some of the reptile shops and things like that. Should we expect to see bootleg versions of your book popping up at some stage? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Look, thank you very much for your time today, Neville. No worries. Thanks, Mike.